Thank you very much, Scott, and uh, thank you to the band. That is the best walk-on music I've ever had. It's also the only walk-on music I've ever had, but uh, it's fun for me. It's also a great night because uh, it's the only time I've ever taken the stage between a governor and a princess, so it's uh, a night of firsts for me. Uh, I'm here tonight, uh, an honor to be here tonight, to pay tribute to a force represented by General Frank Grass, a veteran Army engineer with service dating back to 1969. It's been an honor to work so closely with him this past couple of years. He has carved out an enormous amount of time uh, to spend with Air Force leadership here in DC and around the country when we have our leadership conferences uh, to help us better understand the Guard and better un uh, integrate the Guard into the total force of the Air Force. Thank you for that. Um, you've been a great partner for the Air Force and, and we appreciate all the time you spent with us. We, we think of you at least as an honorary airman. Uh, maybe one day an airman actually and in a different uniform. Um, I'm proud to represent also tonight um, the two top leaders of the Air Force uh, who have guard, National Guard in their blood. Uh, Secretary James, Secretary Deborah James, uh, she started in the Pentagon in the 90s, five years as the Assistant Secretary of Reserve Affairs. And the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General Mark Welsh, his grandfather enlisted in the Army National Guard when he was 18 years old and acting on Broadway. He found his way to the trenches in France in World War I as a private. He finished as a major despite being gassed and injured three different times. So you know General Walsh has a special place for the National Guard in his heart. We are the smallest Air Force we have ever been. With the oldest fleet we were, since we were founded 67 years ago. And we survive in this environment only because we are a total force of active reserve and National Guard. When our combatant commanders call up and say, we need more Air Force, which happens more and more every day, they're not talking about the active force. Air Force doesn't mean the active force to us. It means the total force. Because we're sized, structured, and integrated in a way that makes it impossible for us to generate forces without the National Guard. In fact, when you go downrange and visit airmen, the only way to tell who's active and who's guard is by asking. This is true stateside as well, where we have integrated associations at many bases, active and guard working in blended units and learning from each other. Generally more experienced guardsmen will tell you that the younger airmen keep them up to date on new changes, while younger active airmen will tell you that their guard brothers and sisters show them how to actually get things done. The men and women of the National Guard, both air and ground components, are truly shoulder to shoulder with their active counterparts. We are one force, tested and proven together in these last 13 years of war. Even though I'm with the Air Force, I'm here tonight to brag on the entire National Guard, Air Force, and Army. Since 9-11, 767,000 Guardsmen have deployed to the Middle East, to Africa, and the world over. 115,000 Guardsmen have deployed more than once, and nearly 12,000 are deployed today, right now. After 13 years of war, I often hear from skeptics outside the Air Force, how long can the Guard keep up this deployment rate? But as we draw down our forces in Afghanistan, what I most often hear from airmen in the Guard is, what opportunities will there be for me to continue deploying going forward? Never before has the Guard played a more integrated and critical role in our nation's defense. And the Guard is no stranger, as you know, to valor or heroism. Six Army Guardsmen have received the Distinguished Service Cross, second only to the Medal of Honor for valor in battle. In March 2005, guardsmen from the Kentucky National Guard were escorting supply trucks south of Baghdad when their convoy came under heavy fire. The squad put themselves and their vehicles between the insurgents of the con and the convoy. The squad leader, Staff, Staff Sergeant Timothy Nine, and another soldier, Sergeant Lee Ann Hester, got out of their armored Humvees and led a counterattack. They killed 27 insurgents captured seven more. He was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, and she became the first woman ever in any branch of any service of any part of the total force to be awarded Silver Star for direct combat action against an enemy. 
And by the way, that 2005 deployment was Timothy Nine's third. He was in Bosnia in 2001, Iraq in 2003, and in 2008, he chose to return to Iraq for a second tour and his fourth deployment. Our Air National Guard is a part of the very history of 9-11. Among the jets scrambled to defend the skies over Washington, D.C. that morning were four F-16s from the D.C. Air National Guard. Two of those aircraft, flown by Lieutenant Colonel Mark Sassville and Lieutenant Heather Penny, in order to launch quickly, took to the skies with nothing but training ammunition. At the time, the location and fate of Flight 93 was still unknown and, though to be and thought to be headed in the direction of Washington. Rather than leave the skies over the Capitol, over the White House, defenseless, Sassville and Penny were ready to stop an incoming threat with the only effective weapons they had, their planes and themselves. Their simple plan was to collide with the incoming plane. In fact, the Air National Guard shoulders a significant portion of our homeland defense mission. Through the continental U.S. region for North American Air Defense, or NORAD, the airmen of the 1st Air Force are entrusted with ensuring the aerospace control and air defense of the entire continental United States. And it's not just combat operations. The Guard plays a critical role in U.S. humanitarian assistance. In early October, for example, the Kentucky Air National Guard's 123rd Contingency Response Group flew to Dakar, Senegal, on a Mississippi Air National Guard C-17 with only 36 hours of notice. They're helping to stand up a cargo hub there, funneling life-saving humanitarian supplies into the region to fight Ebola. Military service is a calling for the men and women of the National Guard, just as it is for their active brethren. They believe in the profession of arms, they live the same principles and values, and they wear the same uniform. National Guard members live in nearly every zip code. They're based in more than 3,000 communities across America. So while the number of active duty military installations has dwindled, our Guardsmen have kept alive a vital link to the American people. In a nation in which less than half of a percent of the population serves, this is critical to the military and to the citizenry. The National Guard, as General Grass likes to say, is all in. While on active duty, our Guardsmen face the same challenges that every service member faces, the same dangers, the same tolls on family. Remarkably, they shoulder these burdens while balancing full civilian lives. Our Guardsmen are wounded, too. And yes, they fall in service to our great nation. 778 have made the ultimate sacrifice in the global war on terror. To the men and women of the National Guard, to General Grass, true American patriots, always ready, always there, we honor your service. And congratulations on this most fitting award tonight. Thank you.